the culture in which our Bible was written in, that we haven't trans transitioned into our own life. But in biblical times, um, when somebody sealed a truth, they would do it by clapping their hands. Does that make sense? And so what's interesting is in this culture, when we clap our hands to worship, we think we're just keeping beat and we're just kind of having an expression and it's fun. But the truth is that David, King David said and asked the Lord to teach his hands to do what? To war. And so when we put our hands together and we clap, we're not just doing what the world does at a Garth Brooks concert or anything like that think that when you when you're singing something that you're going yes I believe that and I confirm that that you're teaching your hands to war and what if what if our worship is the spiritual ammunition on the battlefields that we live on can we worship in a way that's that we can picture God picking up that worship and going I'll take that and I will use it against the enemy. When those people clap their hands and they sing their songs together, I'm going to use that for my glory and my renown and their joy. Do me a favor. Meet and greet each other and come back with your hands ready to clap and your voices ready to exalt God. you to just ask God to give you that 
that one thing in your heart, in your life that is, seems like too big of a mountain, too big of a barrier. Maybe it's too big of a canyon that makes you feel separated for, from God. What's your biggest struggle? It could be a circumstance. It could be a sin. When you have that one thing, just put your hand up and down. God, I got this one thing. It could be your health. It could be your finances. It could be a relationship. Now tell that one thing that the cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Sorrow may come in the darkest night, but the cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Evil may put up the strongest fight, but the cross has the final word. Oh, the cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. may put up strong his fight but the cross has the final word oh the cross has the final word the cross has the final word he traded his death for eternal life the cross has the final word Nothing stronger, nothing higher, nothing greater than the name of Jesus. And all the honor, all the power, all the glory to the name of Jesus. There's nothing stronger, nothing higher, nothing greater than the name of Jesus. All the honor, all the power, all the glory to the name of Jesus. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. The Savior has come in the morning light. The cross has the final word. Oh, the cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. He traded his death for eternal life. The cross has the final word. Oh, the cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Traded his death for eternal life. The cross has the final word. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Cause all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so, so good. 
In every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Of your voice, you have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You are close like no other. I know you as a father. I know you as a friend. And I will see the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, oh, I will see the goodness of God. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. My life laid down, I surrender now. I give you hell. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life, and all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I have been able I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God that you would prepare our hearts with your presence this morning, that our words and the meditations of our heart would be pleasing unto you. We ask this in your name, in your nature. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome once again to Pursuit. Um, thank you for coming this morning. Does anybody know what day it is today? Wednesday. All right. Hey, you're getting that. Wonderful. <laughs> I've only said it a thousand times. So, but it is the best day of the week for us to be here and just turn our attention on God and enjoy Him. Um, well, this morning I was sitting down in the choir section. Uh, Sophia was singing so nice, and I got to hear her. And uh, you may have noticed a couple new faces on the stage. So these are my nephews, uh, Will and Jack. And uh, their parents, uh, Brian and Linda, are here. Uh, that's Janine's brother. And uh, her parents, Jack and Judy, welcome. And uh, Linda's parents, um, <coughs> Lois and Steve, are here as well. So kind of a... You cannot have Will and Jack back. <laughs> <laughs> they are ours now. <laughs> so, well, it's, it's good to be here this morning, isn't it? And um, we're going to take some time to pray. By the way, if you've had any uh, incident from the hurricane or need any help with anything, please just let us know, let the deacons know, and uh, we'll see what we can do, do to help and you. And who is the deacon they should let know? Well, Vic and Emmy and others, Keith. So um, let's go to the, the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your goodness uh, this morning to us. Thank you most of all that we get to know Jesus Christ, our Savior and that we can, we can know you through him, and we can fellowship uh, together. So thank you, Lord, for bringing your body, the church, together this morning. Father, we, uh, our mission at Pursuit is to 
pursue belonging, believing, and becoming. So, Father, help us to achieve the different dimensions of that mission statement, that people can come and find a place of belonging in your body, that their strength will be faith and faith, uh, strengthened, that they can believe better in you. And, Lord, help us to become everything that you want us to be individually and as a church. Father, we're grateful for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'd like to invite the deacons to come and receive your tithes and offerings. If you would stand. Aren't you glad that God's love is higher than mountains? And anything you face. This is higher than the mountain that I face. Stronger than the power of the grave. Constant in the trial and the change is one thing. Never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. One thing is one thing. 
Just remind us that we have never been able to comprehend how much you love us. And Lord, as we look into your word this morning, we ask that you reveal to our hearts the depth of our sin and the, the width of your love. And mo may those two things collide in a way that transforms our lives. Lord, that we would not only hear your word, but sense your presence. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The children can be dismissed to their classes. <clears throat> In 1974, when I was 14 years old, my family moved from West Phoenix to Chandler, Arizona, and they decided to take me along with them. Um, so West Phoenix was all that I ever really knew, and I had my friends, I had, I had my friend Tim and Mike, and that's what, all that I needed. Uh, so Tim and I would do funny drawings, and we would read mag Mad Magazine together, and uh, make military battle scenes and build models. Now my friend Mike and I would play basketball and build three-room forts in his backyard, um, and also cause lots of mischief in the neighborhood. So. When we moved to Chandler, it was just a rural town surrounded by farms and cowboys. And uh, so people wore boots and drove trucks, and uh, there were fields for miles and miles around, and cotton gins and sugar beet refineries and all sorts of things I'd never seen before. So I found out that I really did not know how to make new friends, and I was too shy. Um, but I was going into my high, high school uh, as a freshman, and my dad signed me up for basketball without um, asking me about it. Um, so my parents did what was best for the family. And uh, I just had to short, sort of go along for the ride. And uh, they, didn't, they didn't ask me what they were doing. So I think the disciples of Jesus felt that way too. Um, since Jesus asked them to follow him, they did not know what was going on most of the time whether it was the miracles that Jesus did or his enigmatic teaching or certainly the events of his life, they didn't really know what was going on. Um, just like I felt living in a new place and going to basketball boot camp, uh, they did not know what they got themselves into. And so decisions were made and they were not consulted. Now the book of Matthew that we're going through is an amazing book. Um, it shows that Jesus was the expected Messiah and fulfilled the prophecies, but in unexpected ways. So Jesus shows, Matthew shows by Jesus' genealogy that he was descended from David and could be the rightful heir to the throne. Matthew shows that Jesus was worshipped as a king by wise men from the east. Matthew shows that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the prophesied city of David. Matthew shows that Jesus had a herald in John the Baptist and uh, also that he had a coronation ceremony and this was his baptism. So his father and the Holy Spirit came to that ceremony. <clears throat> Matthew shows that when Jesus began to minister, he taught the people and he healed them. So his ministry condemned the false teachers of Israel, the false shepherds of Israel. And if you look at Ezekiel 34, written hundreds of years before his coming, Jesus fulfills that passage. In fulfillment, Jesus was the good shepherd. Um, he healed the sick. He bound up the injured. He brought back the strange sheep. He sought the lost, and he opposed the strong that would take advantage of his sheep. Jesus showed that he was God as well. 
He calmed the storm. He raised a girl from the dead, and he forgave a man of his sins before he healed him. So in chapters 11 and 12, we saw several encounters with Jesus and the responses to him. But the thing is that Jesus did not meet their expectations. So even John the Baptist had asked him, he asked him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? So the Pharisees rejected Jesus as their Messiah because he bro broke their traditions by healing on the Sabbath. So for the first time, their hate even boiled up to thoughts of murder of Jesus. Now, everyone was expecting the Messiah, but nobody was expecting Jesus. So everyone expected the kingdom of God to be coming and to come by the Messiah conquering the oppression of Rome. But Jesus kept on doing things that were unexpected. People would rather hold on to their expectations than believe in the one who was standing right in front of them. Jesus, the Son of God, who was proving himself by miracle after miracle. Even his own disciples persisted in their expectations even after the resurrection. In Acts 1, they asked him, he said, they said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And so they really did not know what was going on uh, yet. In chapter 13 of Matthew that we're going to go through this week, Jesus teaches not so much about who he is, but he teaches about the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus uses parables as well, and it will become apparent that the kingdom of heaven was also not what people were expecting either. Expectations are hard to break. So if we don't understand the kingdom, we can grow discouraged in the gospel and find also that we're seeking things, we're seeking after the wrong things. When we do understand Okay, when we do understand the nature of the kingdom, we will, first of all, we will be grateful that we have been shown the truth. Secondly, we will not doubt the gospel when people fail. And we will bear fruit, and we are willing to sacrifice everything for it. So let's begin by reading in verse 1 of Matthew 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And a great crowds gathered around him, so that he got into the boat, and he sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And he sowed, and some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil that produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? So Jesus gives a long answer, which we're going to look at in a minute. But first, what is a parable? So the word parable comes uh, from two words in Greek, para and balo. And uh, so para means alongside of something, and balo means to throw it or to place something or to lay something down. And so together, these words mean to place something alongside of something else for the sake of comparison. So one thing next to the other. So to illustrate, Jesus will later say in this passage, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Now, if Jesus did not make the comparison, but merely said, the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, but grows larger than all the garden plants, so that the birds can come and make nests in it, then the disciples would say, well, that's really interesting, Jesus. Do you, are you wanting to become a botanist? But no, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that grows to the largest of plants so the birds can come and nest in it. 
So the value is in the comparison. So there's also value there because it's said by Jesus, telling them the comparison. So if I wrote that parable, you might say, well, that's cool, Dave, that's kind of poetic. But because it's Jesus who is telling them something, he has authority. So he's telling them something that only God could know about. It's something that it's never been revealed since the foundation of the world. The kingdom of heaven is like something else. And so something that we could not possibly know about unless God had revealed it through Jesus' teachings. So when we understand the nature of the kingdom, we will be grateful that we have been shown the truth. So when he continues in verse 11, where he explains why he is now using parables. So he, in verse 11, he says, And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So Jesus is now talking to his disciples and not to the great crowds of people. And he tells them that this, they, the disciples, are the audience that he has in mind, not the crowds. And he continues in verse 12, and he says, For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But to the one who, who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and with their eyes they have closed, lest that they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and that I should heal them. So this prophecy of Isaiah comes from chapter 6. Um, so many of you are familiar with what's going on in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah had just had a vision <clears throat> from the Lord, of the Lord. And so Isaiah was a prophet to Israel, and he prophesied that God's judgment was coming and that they were going to be carried away by a conquering nation, the Babylonians. But Isaiah was, was stunned when he saw this vision of the Lord, and he, was, he became aware of his own unholiness. And in this vision, he was cleansed of his sin. And then he heard the Lord saying, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And the message that God gave him was this judgment, Isaiah 6. Go and say to this people, keep on hearing and do not understand. Keep on seeing and do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And so the, paint, the people of ancient Israel had not repented. Um, time and time again, God came to them saying repent, but they had not repented. And so God's disposition was no longer forgiveness, but judgment. Ultimately, it's forgiveness, but right then, it was judgment. Today, today is the favorable day of the Lord, the Bible says. And so while you are alive, we can experience God's love and mercy, and we know that we must turn to Jesus now, because when you're dead, it's too late. So God is also judging our nation. Um, there are a greater and greater number of people that have no faith um, and have no church background. Um, most people do not even believe in the idea of right or wrong um, anymore. And so people used to uh, pursue growing in character and they would pursue uh, growing in virtue as a life's ambition. Um, but today we don't talk about truth. We don't even hardly talk about ethics, and we certainly don't talk about morals. Um, but today we have, instead of all of that, we have values. Um, values are a neutral term, and so you can have your values, and I can have my values, and we'll just have our own separate values. Um, but our nation is under judgment, and it is suffering, 
and it is dying. So Jesus, in <clears throat> chapter 11, had already pronounced woe on the people of Capernaum because they did not believe in him. Um, because they, they did not believe in him, how could they possibly understand these parables of the, what the kingdom of heaven was about? And so um, if they wouldn't believe in him, how could he teach them about the kingdom of heaven? And so Jesus spoke in parables. And it's sort of like you need to understand addition before you can move on to multiplication. So Jesus was, was doing the unexpected by trying or by not trying to gather people to believe in him right then. He was not trying to gather people to believe in him right then. So this is something that the disciples would come to understand. It would be their job to take the gospel to the world. And so right now Jesus is focusing on his disciples. So in verse 16 of Matthew 13, he says, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So previously, Jesus said that the least person in the kingdom of heaven was greater than the greatest person who ever lived. Who is that greatest person that ever lived? It was John the Baptist. Why is this? Why is that true, that the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than the greatest person that ever lived? Because the least in the kingdom knows what all the prophets and even John the Baptist could not yet see, that Jesus was the redeemer to come and save mankind by dying on a cross, and that he was resurrected and that he gives the Holy Spirit to each person that puts their faith in him. So even all of us that are Christians, we understand those basic things that even the prophets and even John the Baptist couldn't see fully yet. And so this is the message that the prophets strained to see. They were given all sorts of mysterious prophecies. But now, like the disciples, we are the privileged ones that were allowed to see that Jesus was the Son of God, come to give his life as a ransom for many. And so we are greater than the greatest prophet because we know what's been hidden since the foundation of the world. So when we understand the nature of the kingdom, we will be grateful that we have been shown the truth. So how else is the kingdom not what they expected? So first of all, it was becoming clear to the disciples that membership in the kingdom was not simply because you were a Jew living in Israel. Um, Jesus was not the sort of Messiah that would come and deliver the nation of Israel from Rome. And so likewise, um, inclusion or salvation was not based on their nationality, but instead by faith in Jesus. So this was new information for the disciples. Um, they probably could not quite comprehend it yet, but they began to see this being worked out. So in verses 18 through 23, Jesus explains the parables of the soils. And he describes that three types of people that fail to believe and one, only one that produces fruit. And so the kingdom membership was not what they expected. In verse 24, Jesus gives another parable that uh, it's called the wheat and the tares. And so let's read that in verse 24. And he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And so when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the the master of the house came and said to him, Master, didn't you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. So his servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? And he said, No, lest the, in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barns. And so the weeds are tares. Um, 
that which looked like wheat until it ripened and made the grain, but it is not edible. And so the disciples may have realized something else at this point, that the perfect kingdom of heaven was not coming to the earth immediately. And so it will, God's kingdom will be affected by Satan's work in the meantime. And so within the church, the kingdom of God on earth, there will be believers and there will be non-believers, um, the wheat and the tares. And so at the end of times, the final judgment was not coming immediately. That was a, kind of a surprise for them. So it was becoming clear that God had a longer plan and will not sort out the good from the evil until the final judgment, until someday in the future. So many times uh, you'll hear someone say, well, I don't go to church because there's too many hypocrites. Um, yes, that is what Jesus is saying in these parables, um, that within the church there will be real believers and there will be false believers. So just show them these verses when they say, I don't go to church because of all the hypocrites. Um, just because there are hypocrites in the church is not an option for Christians not to be in fellowship in a church. So being in a church is God's will for us. And if we don't know that, then we need to be asking ourselves, am I even following God? Um, and what sort of soil am I? So the great early uh, Christian theologian, um, Augustine, said that the church is made up of the visible church and the invisible church. So there's an invisible church here. Right? This is the visible church. But what it is, is that the visible church is what we see every time that we, the church gathers, or any church gathers. There will be some whose seed has fallen on hard soil, and the birds are coming for it. Others will have had their seed fall on the rocky ground and will appear to follow Christ, but then will fall away. And then there are some whose seed will be choked out by cares of the world. And so we can, we can see the person that's at church, but we can't see what type of soil that they are in. And that's the visible church. And so the invisible church is only what God can see. And those are those that have true faith in Christ and will have eternal life and be in heaven with him. Now, so we've had, we've had many people in this church um, that have come and stayed for a while and then they go away. Um, and it's true in, in every church. Um, people come and they may play on the worship team and then they're gone and they ghost us. Um, others may say, well, we're looking for something else. Uh, but then you find out that they're not attending church anywhere. Um, and so it can be, it can seem unsettling to a believer to, to think about this. Am I one of those that falls away? Um, and we should have some of that concern, but we are told to look at the fruit that's in our lives, um, and it will reveal what sort of person that we are. And so we're going to talk more about that in a minute. So John the Apostle wrote this. He said in, in John chapter 2, they went out from us, but they were not of us, for they had not, if they had been of us, they would not, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. So, how do these parables help us? Uh, slide number four. Um, when we understand the nature of the kingdom, we will not doubt the gospel when people fail. So, our faith as Christians is not in people. Of course, it's sad to see people fail. But our faith is in Christ. So, people in the church will fail. And failure does not prove that you're not in the kingdom. Um, but when they, when they fall away from being part of the body or they say, well, I tried that once and they're moving on to some re other religion, then it seems apparent that they're not really of us. So a few, few weeks ago, we watched a, a short video clip of um, some Gen Z students that were asked to watch this chosen uh, TV series. And uh, they, they interviewed them about their impressions um, of this, and there was one young woman shared 
about her life and how she was sexually abused by an elder in her church. And it devastated her. Now, if anyone could have grounds to judge the gospel, um, it could be her, but not before God. And so the Chosen's depiction of Christ renewed her faith in Christ despite of what that man had done for her, to her. And so she understood that Satan had sown evil and bad seed in the church where Christ had planted good seed. And so we should not question the gospel, but the evil persons that we sometimes find in the church. So Jesus continues about the kingdom of heaven in verse 31. And he put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in its field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it's larger than all of the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds can come and make nests in its branches. So he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. So all these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. So Jesus, as we talked about, is telling his disciples things that have been hidden since the foundation of the world. And that's concerning the gospel and the kingdom. So he compares the kingdom to a mustard plant with birds in it and to a woman that leavens some dough. Those are kind of strange comparisons to the kingdom of heaven, if you think about it. Um, but we see from these parables that the kingdom can grow exponentially from small, the smallest beginnings. A single believer God can use to bring great things. And so James Boyce, in his commentary, says something intriguing as well. He says, perhaps based on the, the context of these parables, like the four soils and the weed and the tares, um, they, they also may speak of this idea of evil being introduced into the church. And so he says that the birds may represent evil infiltrating the church or nesting in the mustard plant, so to speak. So the birds are depicted as evil in the previous example by coming and taking away the seeds um, from a person's heart. So leaven is also frequently used as an illustration of evil in the Bible. And so it makes sense what he's saying. These parables, rather than merely talking about the explosive growth potential of the church and the, and the kingdom of heaven, are also speaking about evil in the church too. So we have, put, we have certainly plenty of examples of evil nesting in churches. So they explode in growth, uh, some scandal happens, and then they fall apart. But Jesus shares more parables in verse uh, 44. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that's thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it to shore and they sat down and they sorted the good into containers and then they threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate out the evil from the righteous and throw them into a fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, we don't like to hear about weeping and gnashing of teeth, but Jesus talks about it. And this, there will be a final judgment, and God will separate the good from the bad. Now, we all know, of course, from hearing the gospel every week, week after week, that we are not saved by our own good works. Um, that's an insult to God and to Jesus' death on the cross to imagine that we could be ever be good enough for God. Um, but our works, on the other hand, are expected. 
Um, if we've been given new life and regenerated by the Holy Spirit, um, then there ought to be good works in our lives. God created each believer for good works to be an example of his craftsmanship. So we see this in Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. It's not a result of our works so that no one should boast. So our salvation is by grace through faith, and it's a gift from God. In verse 10, it says, But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In Philippians 2, also, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So when we understand the nature of the kingdom, we will bear fruit and we are willing to sacrifice everything for it. So there's a couple of positive parables here that show how much the kingdom of God is worth. So people go and sell all they have to get it. God expects that kind of excitement within us. It's worth everything. So the chapter ends with Jesus also being rejected again in, uh, in verse 53. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So they took it... Um, they took offense at Jesus. Um, Jesus was not the Messiah that they expected, um, and his teachings about the kingdom also were not what they expected either. So the disciples learned uh, many things about the kingdom that they did not expect. So they learned that God's plan was longer and more complex uh, than the, that they knew about. It also included the Gentiles. That was new to them, not just the Jews. And, of course, all of us can be grateful for that. It included the establishment of the church or gathering of God's people, Jews and Gentiles, in one body to show God's glory. So inclusion of the kingdom was going to be by faith in Christ and made up of people with a new heart, born again and renewed in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies of God pouring out his spirit on his people. They learned that Satan would also be working too, and that there would be good seed and bad seed within the body of the church, and that they should not be discouraged with the gospel when they see people fail. They learned that they were privileged to know the things that were hidden since the foundation of the world, so as we are too. They learned that God cared about the fruit that they would bear. God cares about our fruit. It was Jesus' will that we all bear much fruit and glorify God. So these things were not immediately clear to the disciples, though they had been taught. And like us, we can hear things and learn things, but we have to live things. And they had to live that too. They had to see and experience Jesus' death on the cross. They had to see his resurrection to new life. They had to see him ascend into heaven. They had to experience the coming of the Holy Spirit before all these things that Jesus taught them finally began to make real sense. They were going to have to experience these things in order to understand their role in it, and that is to take the gospel to the world. They were going to have their part in building the kingdom of heaven on earth. So each one of us um, should be overwhelmed with gratitude 
um, that God has chosen us to know the things that have been hidden since the foundation of the world, to see that we have a part just like the disciples do in bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for these parables and this teaching about the kingdom of heaven. Lord, we learn many things about your plan. It wasn't what was expected, but Lord, we're grateful for it, that it includes us, that it includes us that we can know your will, your plan of salvation that was hidden from the foundation of the world, and that we can have a part of that plan to take the gospel to the world. Thank you, Lord, for choosing us. Thank you for revealing these things to us. We are grateful in Jesus' name. Amen. Would please stand. All revelation requires a response. How will we respond to the word this morning? By proclaiming the power of the cross. The cross has the fine word. The cross has the fine word. Sorrow may come in the darkest night, but the cross has the fine word. Oh, the cross has the fine word. The cross has the fine word. Evil may put up its strongest fight. But the cross has the final word. Oh, the cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. The Savior has come in the morning light. The cross has the final word. Oh, the cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. He traded his death for eternal life. The cross has the final word. There's nothing stronger, nothing higher. Nothing greater than the name of Jesus. And all the honor, all the power, all the glory to the name of Jesus. There's nothing stronger, nothing higher, nothing greater than the name of Jesus. And all the honor, all the power. All the glory to the name of Jesus. Cause the cross has a final word. The cross has a final word. The Savior has come in the morning light. The cross has a final word. Oh, the cross has a final word the cross has a final word he traded his death for eternal life the cross has a final word the cross has a final word the cross has a final word. He traded his death for eternal life. The cross has a final word. And now for the benediction. The benediction is God's blessing to you through his word. I read from 1 John. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us eternal life. Go and be blessed. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. Cause he opened the prison doors, parted the raging sea. Our God still holds a victory. Come on now. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't cry him. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is shining in this place. We won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. We worship the Buddhas, we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, and he rose up from that grave, God still rolling stones away. of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is shining in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven. Redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. The joy in the house of the Lord. House of the Lord today, and we, we won't, won't be quiet. quiet. We shout out the praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise.